there's so many of you guys. Um, hi, oh, it starts right on the type. Hi, I'm Keitra. Um, and uh, I have a really meandering career. Um, I do a little bit of this stuff. Um, so lettering or working with language. Um, I do some object design, and I do lots of uh, participatory installations. Um, so the work that <laughs> the work that's showing here is stuff that I authored, and and this kind of stuff is usually funded under the title art installation. But then I also uh, play a very similar role when I'm working as an experiential design director for a client-driven works like this. And for these things, I'm usually working with a lot bigger teams to make them happen. And uh, up until 2014, I was living in New York City, um, and this was how I made most of my cash. And then I made that really big change that we mentioned. Um, I moved to Alaska. And yeah. <laughs> And I was actually born there, so it's not as extreme as it sounds initially. Um, this photo was taken about 10 minutes away from my childhood home. Uh, can you guys see me? There, in the corner? Yeah. So I was born and raised there, but I spent all of my adult life outside of Alaska in relatively urban environments. And moving back was an intense adaptive process. And actually, the reason why I moved back is a little sad. My dad was sick, so it was really important that I was closer to him. Um, so I packed up my husband and occasional collaborator, J.K. Keller, and our two pups. And we moved to five hours south of where my parents live, so like just far enough away that I could kind of stay sane. Uh, and we live right outside of a, or a little ways outside of a town called Homer, for those of you who know the area. And we, de we decided we would test this claim that these days we can all work from anywhere. But um, we really are back in the middle of nowhere. We live on this mountain range that overlooks Homer. Our house is here. Do you see it? Oh, so this kind of rural context meant that I had to tweak the exact focus of my job just a little bit. Um, but fortunately, our house came with a ton of amazing resources. Um, all of it was really messy, but amazing. And uh, most importantly, we have the internet. So we thought, okay, we can actually make this thing happen. Um, and I gave myself the first year of being there to just figure things out, to, to take time and uh, clean the place up and recalibrate my entire life and my practice and kind of take a sabbatical. And this whole process really felt like being back in grad school again. So initially, instead of just completely freaking out um, and to get myself making in this new context, I decided to utilize a process that I used in grad school. Um, and that was doing one-a-day exercises. So I first did this back in 2004 during my first year at Cranbrook. Um, and I have some examples that are really humiliating, but here they are. So these are one-a-day examples from grad school and a couple from Alaska. So this stuff is um, kind of reactionary making. And in grad school, I gave myself 24 hours to, <laughs> it's a little snarky, a lot of this stuff, tw a 24-hour period to create a project. <laughs> That's Frankie, she'll make another appearance later. She's great. Um, so I had to finish a project in 24 hours, idea to finish. And then um, in, in Alaska, I was a little bit looser with the constraints, but the idea is to make really quickly and intuitively and not overthink stuff. And in Alaska, or in grad school, um, I did all of the one-a-day studies, and then I took some time away from the work. Uh, came back to it with fresh eyes, and then looked at how 
I naturally made work and what I was naturally making work about. And this is actually the way that I developed my original list of missions and methods that kind of became my guides ever since grad school. And it turns out that these methods, I actually call them my personal reminders, these methods are still pretty spot on for how I make. But I did have one really big revelation. I was missing probably the most important, all-encompassing bullet point on this list, which is to seek the beginner's mind. And um, this is very much in alignment with a, what a lot of people have been talking about, that whole provoking curiosity and making room for it in your life. So I'm on board too. And actually most of these other methods are kind of subsets or like very specific applications of that bigger seeking the beginner's mind initiative. And so when I say this, I'm not just talking about um, any type of learning, but that specific type of learning or discovery or exploration that really feeds you creative fuel. And when I looked back on all of my Alaska one-a-day studies, and actually when I thought about all the work that I've kind of ever made that I'm proud of or really satisfied by, it's all kind of resulted from this um, like a magic combination of a little bit of wisdom or know-how and that beginner's mind state. And the more um, kind of experienced I get, the more honed my ways become, the more deliberate I have to be about making time for this thing because it is super disruptive and unpredictable. But it's the one thing that always encourages me to produce newer work and take bigger, I want to say braver, but it the truth is like slightly naive risks and keeps me engaged and excited about my practice and how I really live my whole life. So um, today, since this initiative is so important to me, uh, I thought I would share, a, it feels a little risky, but um, this very process focused exploratory like ripple effect series of works um, that show how I've made room for this methodology in my practice. Okay, here we go. So I'm starting with these making through breaking studies that actually I do um, alongside of my partner, J.K. Keller. So by breaking, I just mean using things in ways they weren't intended to be used. Um, and we do these studies outside of client-based work or really any output-focused work. So it's open exploration, and I'm usually looking for interesting form. So these breaking studies are all over the place. We use um, traditional tools and materials. We use new technologies. Um, and we use like more ubiquitous tools uh, like uh, Adobe Creative Suite. Um, and I keep records, kind of ongoing documentation of these studies. And then I use these little seeds of ideas and apply them when I see opportunities to flesh them out in more finalized projects. And I'm showing both the little seed studies and some of the more finalized results in this slideshow. And one of the reasons that I really love doing these studies outside of the fact that they're fun and get me to that beginner's mind state is because it gives me a great excuse to always be exposing myself to emerging technologies. Um, I've always felt incredibly influenced by my tools. Um, I find them very empowering, but they can also set these unintended restrictions, and they have a really big impact on the way I think about making. And I like to have a more active participation with where those boundaries start to develop and grow and leverage that influence a little bit more intentionally. So by giving myself these brief periods of time to just kind of dive into that curiosity, um, I'm always ex expanding my tool set and opening myself up for new techniques. And I get a ton of inspiration inspiration from this process. And the next project I'll share 
um, was inspired by some of the computational generative breaking studies, uh, specifically the layered ones. Um, and we looked at this uh, digital processes and we kind of translated it into a, a physical process. So this is another series that I collaborated with J.K. Keller. He's in the audience, so haha, this talk is about you. Um, uh, so these, these works, uh, the idea was we wanted to physically mimic the emotional state of dwelling on something or dwelling on a thought. So we used a material to create this evolution and loss of original thought over time. So what we did was we started by creating these positive type forms. And then we would hand swab hot wax layer after layer after layer onto this guy, literally dwelling on this message. And so we keep going until the beast reaches the appropriate size, and then we flip it over and slice it down, and we pull those positive type forms out of the work. So you're left with this echo and evolution. And this entire um, fabrication process really highlights how horrible I am at retaining my curiosity. I, when we're, it's either that or it highlights how much of a control freak I am. But um, So when we're building these, I really cannot help myself from like picking at it a little bit or kind of trying to slice into it. So do you see the little mounds that are kind of hopping around the screen? As a, those are actually these little sample slab guys that we started doing in tandem with the bigger works. So I can get my grubby paws onto the inside. So interstitially, I can pick those up and slice into them, which feels so good, and it solved my behavioral problems, um, which was good because we were invited to create an even bigger one of these for the graphic design now in production show back in uh, 2011. So super high bar, so much more stressful. Um, and part of the stress was because of, I was worried I was gonna cut into it, but the other stress was um, the scale shift just meant a lot of things had to be reconsidered. Um, so one of the, we had 500 pounds of wax to get to somewhere, there's Frankie again, amazing shipping crates, but then things like, what happens when you lock 150 pounds of layered wax in an art handler's van on a really hot Baltimore summer day? Uh, so we actually did some tests. It was really not good, but we figured it out and we got it fixed and we made this big final piece happen. So um, I got to go to the show while it was at the Walker Art Center. And uh, I was there kind of looking at everything and really trying my best to not watch people looking at the layered wax piece. Um, and then I noticed this like older gentleman and these two kids come up and start looking at the piece. And I imagine they were like grandfather and grandchildren. And so the kids are pointing and ooh, ooh, ooh. And then the grandfather comes over and kneels down and he starts kind of miming how the piece was fabricated. And of course I'm like, yes, yes. And the kids are nodding, looking at him. And then the littlest boy all of a sudden goes, and he squats down over the piece and he like karate chops across the top of it, like slicing it. And then he looks at his grandfather and his grandpa's like, yes. And the kids are like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, trying not to be this creep in the corner staring at him. But right then I realized that I had been so wrapped up in this, the practical fabrication concerns of the work and viewing it from this a little too heady graphic design perspective and then just freaked out about it living amongst the gods of graphic design that I'd totally forgotten about all of these incredibly important factors to me. 
um, which are to provide a really accessible entry point into the work, and then also to pique these moments of curiosity or a little bit of critical inquiry, um, which is like a hint at that beginner's mind state. So to have that come through still, even though I'd forgotten, and then for it to be this like lovely cross-generational teaching moment was awesome. So during this sabbatical period, I was thinking a lot about those ideas, this providing accessible entry points and leading people to figure out fabrication. And I had also been looking for a good excuse to share these beautiful moments that I was finding while we, we were building these layered waxworks, which leads me to the next project, crayons. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to try and replicate those beautiful moments in wax and make creative tools, and hopefully create a tool that calls attention to its fabrication. Um, and I wanted to use a form that really encapsulates that beginner's approach to creativity. So I started by taking scraps from that original layered wax process. So on the left-hand side, those are actually bits that got caught in the bottom of my sink drain. It was kind of gross. But then I took those and cast them into colored wax, hoping to create this beautiful tool. So they are crayons but they are a little more grown up. And I, I sent these cast, the original casting out to friends, and really quickly I started getting retail requests for them, which is great, so I quickly tried to scale up production and refine the fabrication, and I went through the process of productizing them, and now they're available for wholesale, and they're being carried internationally, and it's all happened really fast and been pretty dreamy, and right now I'm kind of considering to whether I should make it a bigger endeavor and expand the product line or what to do with it, but there's this other motivating thought behind the crayons that the project hasn't completely wrapped up yet. Um, and it's a thought that was also inspired by those layered wax pieces. So um, when JK and I are done with those layered wax works, we'll put them up for sale or we'll offer them to people to use as material in new work. Um, so transform them somehow. But every time we offer them to someone as material, they look at us like we're doing something horrible. They look at us like we kicked a puppy or something. And that response made me wonder if my infatuation with process and love of process is kind of out of balance with my appreciation for the final product. So with these crayons, I wanted to see how much perceived craft has to go into a tool in order to override its intended application. So when does it go from tool for use to beautiful object to keep and kind of see where other people draw that line between investing in process and, and keeping the product. So after sending these guys out, immediately the dialogue was, oh, I can't wait to see what kind of crazy marks these make. And no, 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 they're too beautiful. You can't use them. So it, it kind of worked. It definitely highlights this divide in opinion, and I feel a little less crazy, but um, now, now I feel kind of bad. Um, I, I really should be encouraging people to just kind of dive right into their curiosity and not force them to make, make a sacrifice for it, which brings me to the last little project I'll share with you guys, which is not a resolved project at all. I'm just at the very beginning. So now I'm using these remnants and outtakes from the crayon fabrication process to create these mystery chunks. And that's not actually what I'm calling them. I just don't have the name yet. But um, these guys are not pretty on the outside, which hopefully shifts all of the focus to finding out what is inside. And I'm currently trying to figure out the best way to kind of present these chunks to people and then gracefully 
reveal the hidden treasure inside and make it easy and rewarding and encourage this ongoing exploration. But the actual process of bisecting these is like labor intensive, so I have to do that. So my first thought is I ask the recipient to choose a chunk and then I slice them into these raw gems that the user can receive and then color with and continue to reveal, did I hit that? Continue to reveal all the good stuff that's inside. So that's one idea. Um, and then I'm definitely going to offer these chunks up for a more involved authorship. And my hope there is to actually invite more collaboration out to my totally remote like lonely, isolated lifestyle. Um, but one way I could do this is to ask designers to send me their 3D files. And then I could carve those files using our CNC machine out of these mystery chunks and then send the recipient the results. Um, and that means I get to watch that cool reveal carving process. So that will definitely happen. And then there's one last little thing that I'll show. Um, I attempted to use a drill press to lathe one of these chunks, which was really fun and dangerous and a lot more breaking than making, but I ended up with a little prototype for another mark making tool, which is a little top that doodles when you spin it. And I think this guy has a lot of potential, so he might become something bigger. And that brings me to the end, so thank you. <laughs> okay. So I think you, you proved uh, you can work from anywhere, but also, um, but where you are affects your work. Yes, very much sure. so. I mean, you wouldn't, I'm just, I just look at those like, that room and drill presses and lathes and stuff and realize that that wouldn't have happened in New York City. It, well, <laughs> you make a lot of friends and then it happens, yeah. but yeah, definitely not my own space, but. Yeah, and so talk about that, I mean like when you, I, I, I loved, I saw like a theme throughout a lot of the work where these, um, these analog analogs to your digital tools that you had, you know, or d yeah. digital practice that you had developed. Yeah. Um, and one of them is like, I love the idea of those mounds. So like you, you, had, you had this huge mass, you can't mess with the mass, but your, your, your normal process of your digital fussiness of touching every little pixel and moving things, yeah. so you created an analog of that. Yeah. So how did you just come up with that? I mean, just that coping mechanism. Well, the funny it. thing is, so I really am a control freak, and um, I, I, the, computational fussiness, actually the way that I learned to leverage a lot of, um, I, I started to think about it as actually a collaborative practice. Um, so leveraging uh, generative processes on the computer to let myself get away from being fussy. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of those things that if I can ask something else to create something for me, um, like set up a system, let the system play right, out, right. and then take that content that results and then control it, I start to create a space for the unknown to happen immediately. So that was happening in the digital realm. Right. And then essentially we created the same kind of system, like with the layering wax processes, there's a rule system there and you repeat that rule system and let it play out until you stop. So it's actually more of a replication of that relinquishing control in the digital space. Yeah. Trans Translated to the physical. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I remember when I was in, in school, uh, this was about 20 years ago, when the computers were not as good, uh, I had a friend <laughs> who, would, who would set up some sort of thing to render, and he'd go, in 14 hours, something <laughs> awesome is going to happen. And it makes that lovely noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and I love these crayons, and every time I've shown someone a picture of these crayons, I can see why you get orders like immediately because they're beautiful, but I am fascinated by this anxiety that you produce in people when they get them and they go, oh, wait a minute, if I use them, I will destroy them. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, and I think you said it makes you feel bad. I don't really believe you. Um, I think yeah, I kind you of kind feel of like it. <laughs> 
Um, it so, is flattering, so not totally bad. It's a wicked bet. It's a good bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's an obvious solution. Buy two. Buy two, exactly. <laughs> or three, just go for it. And gift it, yeah. <laughs> um, and so you mentioned your collaborator a few times who's also your husband. Happens to be a romantic partner, but okay. very separate Just, processes. <laughs> well, tell me about that and what that managing... <laughs> there was so many levels of entendre there, I can't even <laughs> count them. Um, so, so uh, tell me what n navigating that is like. I just cannot get like creative relationship puns out of my head now. Um, navigating that is, I don't know, you put two like crazy um, manic artists in a house together and alone, alone, in, on the hill, Actually, that's surrounded the by moose. Biggest, <laughs> surrounded by mo a moose, to, anyway, moose, totally unexpected. Um, I should have known better, I'm from there, but um, Actually, the funny thing is the one-a-day exercises, uh, I, don't, I don't think I'll ever learn how confessional they become, but um, there was that lovesick <laughs> blanket where the, right. it's woven together. So um, I really didn't appreciate how much, I'll call it passive social interaction, but basically when I was living in New York City, I got so much stimulus from just existing in the same spaces as other people. And there was conversation before about eavesdropping on public transit conversation. And that's like the subway alone was so inspiring for the type of work that I make all the time, which happens to be a lot about social dynamics. Mm. And so then I'm, I stripped all of that away and I just am in the middle of nowhere with one dude who doesn't talk a lot. And um, yeah, so it's a little distorted. So we're hyper aware of one another's creative highs and lows. Um, and I think that our proximity influences, since they're now exclusively just one another or whatever we access through our screens, which are our windows to the rest of the world now, um, it, it has a profound effect, and I think I was getting um, upset about I was a little disgusted with myself, that lovesick blanket, I think. I made it, not fully realizing that I was, like, right. upset with the context. But now that I'm aware, we're, you know, we're back on a healthy... <laughs> no, it's a totally dysfunctional, but it's a great path. It's a productive path. <laughs> what kind of internet... Oh, this is you... therapy. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, in front of just a <laughs> thousand of your closest friends. Uh, uh, that's, um, that is remarkable. So, like, so, so when you're choosing the words, do you choose the words that you pour with wax over and you have to live with those words for days and days? We fight about the, well, anyway, those, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, I, but that's, that's a, I mean, you have to live with this, like, single expression until it becomes covered in wax. And you're, it's not only that, the thing you're making is about dwelling on it. Like, you have to dwell on it. We that are word. physically dwelling on, on it. That word. Spending joint custody it, dwelling on it. Right. I mean, does it. Have you noticed a difference between what word you choose and the way you feel when you're dwelling on it? No. It really is. I think that. It, actually, that's very insightful, Roman. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I, I think that the obsessive tendency is very divorced from the message itself. I see. But, yeah. And so you're a label. So you like create, just like these iterative digital things, you create this algorithm to almost like take your. Yeah, they, they, the they are performing their job, exactly. and you are facilitating that. You yeah. are the cog in the, in the system you set up. So. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, it's almost like, again, you're setting up this thing to cope with your own, you, you know your own behavior. Yeah. It's so. all just coping, right? Right. <laughs> really, it's therapy. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, so, like, have you thought about if you were to ever return to a more populated area, would your work, I mean, I, th I think it's safe to say your work would change. Have you thought about what the next iteration of what you do is? I or? am right. I have no. So I actually have been contending with this, the metaphor of being 
drug behind a vehicle versus driving the vehicle. And I think I was just like being drug behind my life and now I, I get to take the wheel again. Um, I miss being around people. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking there might be a, either I spend a month or two in a highly creative making space because I like to be in close proximity with other people making stuff, not even necessarily on the same work. But um, I now really appreciate how much being in the same physical space impacts me in a different way than having the digital exposure does. So, and I think um, both modes are beneficial, but I'm definitely wanting the other one right now. Yeah. I mean, do you think that that's going to be your life, like sort of going back and forth? If I had way? to guess, yeah, that yeah. would be pretty dreamy. I yeah. think I always swing back and forth, um, and it's like the four-year cyclical. Yeah. You get itchy and restless, and then you jump to a new place and figure it out all over again. So. I mean, I, I just, the, I, I still am sort of fascinated by that. You, you move to the biggest state in the union, and you create this big work that, you know, is, is just the mechanics of even moving it are yeah. insanely difficult. Yeah, a little naive. No, yeah. <laughs> I'll go for it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's what we've seen each of these times when people have been presenting, is like with the uh, Museum of Awe and... and I know, which, those, I so am submitting my application to that. <laughs> yeah, that's... So good. But that, that sort of thing where we just like, you just do it, and then you figure out a way to cope with it. Like, the world yeah. will help you out right. if you just do the thing. Yeah, it's um, true. And, you know, and, and so that's a, that's a good lesson. I'm just amazed you get internet up there. I barely get internet in my hill in We Berkeley. get better internet than we got in New York, so. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is wrong? Um, well, thank you. Uh, you do great work. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.